Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to go over today about some basic things on aerification, aeration of your surfaces. Try to get a little bit of this in here uh, in terms of a little bit of everything. And it's kind of a broad overview of, of what you can do and kind of how you ought to, ought to develop a program. It's like anything else. I look at aer aeration of surfaces no differently than I look at uh, establishing a, a turf maintenance program in general for fertility or any of these kind of things, it's a program and you have to develop it so that it's, it, it is looked at as a, as a holistic approach to what you're doing at your facility. Uh, it's it's an important piece of what you're doing at your facility. And you, you need to make sure you look at it that way. I like to sit down at the beginning of the year, whether I'm, I'm uh, consulting on a sports field or a, a, an equine facility, whatever the case may be, and lay out a program for the entire season. That way it gives you the best opportunity to really plan ahead on what you're going to do. Most of us in, in the professional sports world have the advantage of having a schedule in front of us. I think it, it doesn't matter what you're working in. We all have a schedule that we, we have to deal with. So being able to sit there and plug in according to your schedule where you can fit aerification into your program, where you can fit your fertilization into your program, everything kind of goes hand in hand. So being able to do that's important. And it also gives you the ability to, to, again, plan ahead and give yourself the best opportunity for success. So let's roll into this here and uh, see if I can get this out of the way. What we're gonna discuss today are kind of the benefits, the frequency, the time shape, and the equipment that you really have available to you to go ahead and do your aerification uh, procedures. General benefits of, of aerification. Number one, it reduces field compaction or surface compaction. That's the main thing that we're trying to do here in a lot of instances is get that surface that's been compacted from constant use and wear, trying to loosen it up a bit, allow for increased rooting. If your surface isn't as hard, if, if the underlying surface isn't as hard, it's gonna make it a lot easier for those roots to penetrate and, and do what they're supposed to do. Better roots always leads to better stability, and that's what everybody's looking for, no matter what sport you're dealing with, whether it be uh, an equine surface, a, a horse track, an, an eventing track, or a, a football field for that matter. Uh, rooting is always a good thing to have, and the more of it that you can produce out there and the deeper uh, and stronger root structure you're able to put forward, it's always a positive thing in, in the world that we all work in. Increased water infiltration kind of goes hand in hand with, with deeper rooting. You know, the, the better you can get water to infiltrate that, that subsurface underneath your grass and penetrate down into the deeper layers, it's gonna encourage those roots to seek out that deeper water and, and, and basically allow you to get a, a more well-developed, stronger root system in general. Increased air and gas exchange. You know, I, I can't emphasize that enough We've done a lot of work over the years uh, in, the, in the baseball side of things, particularly where we've got O2 sensors buried underneath our playing surfaces. And one of the interesting things you notice is the summer months come along and the microbes start doing their job, breaking down organic type nitrogens, uh, which is really part of that whole process that, that goes on in growing any kind of grass. The byproduct of, of those microbes doing their job is they, they release a lot of gas because they do release a lot of gas that pushes the, the oxygen out of there. And, and it's, it's key that you have that oxygen air exchange going on down in the root zone. A lot of us in the professional sports world use sub air units. And, and we've seen a lot of that going on in, in the golf world as well as professional sports. We're able to actually blow air into our drainage systems and forcibly exchange that air. Probably not very realistic for most equine surfaces certainly not something that's gonna be cost effective in most cases in your world. So the next best thing you can do is punch holes. You wanna go ahead and create that channel to let that air and that oxygen air exchange occur. And airification is simply the, the cheapest, best way to achieve that goal. At the end of the day, what you're going for is really to create a, a softer and safer surface. Um, talking to, to Dr. Peterson over the years, one of the things that we've found out when it comes to equine surfaces is that you know there's that balance between a, a track that's being that's running too firm or one that's running too soft. So if you're dealing with a surface that's too firm, you have to have an effective way to loosen that thing up a bit so that the horses 
are able to run on it without without injuring themselves and breaking down. So aerification plays an important part in, in allowing you to manage that surface correctly to achieve that goal of a safe surface all the time. You know, bottom line, aerification almost always leads to better grass in general. Um, and that's really what we're looking for is always, always to be able to create the best surface we can out there for the athletes. And in, in, in the case of equine surfaces, that's, that's the horses. You know, it can be used to reduce that surface hardness in, in equine specific benefits. It can be used to reduce the surface hardness. It increases the grip for the hoof and the toe. Uh, we're getting into an area here that's better spoken to most likely by, by Dr. Peterson, but from what he tells me, uh, you know, that's kind of the end game, what we're looking for here. And again, like I just mentioned, it, it gives you a tool to help adjust that firmness to a safer level. Um, do a lot of work with penetrometer readings on, on tracks on the grass surfaces, and they can give you a pretty easy way to tell kind of how your, your turf track is running on any given day or how it's going to perform. If you find out that as you take those penetrometer readings around that, that track, and you're finding out that you're coming back too, too firm, then coming out there with an air, air fryer and being able to loosen that surface up slightly, even during a meet, uh, can be beneficial as long as it's done properly uh, and with a, with a game plan in mind. You know, frequency in general, and these are general guidelines, you know, you want to at least get out there and airify uh, once a month during the season, if at all possible, during the growing season. Um, you want to avoid those hot, dry days. Even if you've got a Bermuda grass surface, it's not necessarily a great idea to go punching holes into a, into a surface when you've got very, very, very low humidity and high heat. It'll just suck the moisture out of there unless you've got the ability to get the water back onto that thing and, and irrigate it immediately. Still, I always like to wait until my humidity levels are up a little bit so we're not stressing the surface out any more than we absolutely possibly have to. Um, mix up your treatments. That's the best advice I can give people is mix and match. Have a couple of different pieces of equipment you can do your aerification program with. Uh, that's important. It allows you to do different things with different pieces of equipment. We're going to talk about that a little bit more as we, as we get into this. Use a variety of time shapes, sizes, and penetration depths. You know, one of the things that we've run into over the years, and you look at the research on a lot of this, is if you go out and you airify all the time at the same exact depth with the same exact machine, you run the real risk of actually creating a hard pan down in the soil. So, for instance, if you're always going out with a four inch long core airifying tine at the bottom of that four inches, if you keep doing that consistently year after year after year, month after month, you can create a hard pan down there four inches in the soil, which will then start creating problems for water infiltration and everything else. So we don't want to do that. Mix it up is going to be the best way to avoid that, whether it be changing your time depths, changing the type of machinery you're, you're using. All of those things play an important role in making sure that you're not causing yourselves problems by trying to do a process that's really designed to help you, uh, you avoid many problems. Um, at a minimum, you should be aerifying once a growing season. I mean, this is bare bones at a minimum. You know, and if you're going to do it once a year, in cool season at least, preferably do that in the fall. If you're on a Bermuda grass surface, you probably want to go ahead and do that more at, at the beginning to the middle of the summer months. Two to three times a year at a minimum is better. You know, again, work around or work with your meat schedule to really give yourself the best, best uh, opportunity of being successful with a good program. Program. Your spacing should be as tight as reasonably possible when you're when you're getting out there and doing it. Three to four inches is pretty typical, and that's a that's a really nice spacing for most applications. We're gonna go. I'm gonna show you a chart here on the next uh, slide to demonstrate what I'm talking about here with this next comment, being that larger tines uh, do not always equal better aerification across the surface. Um, core removal versus non-removal of cores. Well, the simple answer to that is, and I get asked that a lot, you know, should I take my cores out? Should I not take the cores up? It depends. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. You know, we mentioned here at the beginning of the, of the talks today that they're looking at doing a sand cap at Keeneland. You know, when you start consistently top dressing a sand layer onto the top of your surface, it's most likely not a great idea to go out and start pulling cores that, that extend beyond that sand cap and not removing them. In other words, you don't want to start mixing your sand layer on the top with the underlying native soil profile, because what you run the risk of then is contaminating your sand layer 
and creating yourself some drainage issues and performance issues later on. So uh, generally speaking, if you've got a native soil tract that you're not top dressing frequently or you're top dressing with more of an organic type material, you don't really need to get rid of those cores. You can break them up, you can drag them in, you can do whatever you need to do that way. If your goal is to come out there and actually start creating a sand cap on top of that surface, then yes, you probably want to get that, that native soil core removed from the track. If you've got a sandier, more mod modified growing medium, and that's what you're dealing with in general, the whole entire profile is, is the same medium, then you know you can just try to go out there and remove the little thatch layer that comes out when you run a core air fryer across it if you if you want to and, and get rid of that debris layer and you can break the rest of the core up and let it go back down in there. Bottom line is you don't want to mix your soil types together. If you've got a if you've got a cap type design track, you certainly don't want to have the native soils uh, intermixing with the with the sandier layers because it's going to cause you problems later on. When do you want to use, you know, your aerification ideally? Well, on cool season turf, you know, general general guideline on that is in the spring, March through June. You know, one of the downsides to doing spring aerification is, you know, if you're have a facility that you're you're putting down pre-emergence on, you have some POA problems on it. Uh, spring aerifications can lead to an increased population of POANA on your on your surface, and if you're dealing with a lot of POANA, you know it's not a deep rooting grass. It's it's a poor performing grass for any type of sport use, particularly equine surfaces, because it just doesn't give you the rooting and the stability the stability that you need. So those annual bluegrass, you know, infestations, we're trying to avoid those most of the time. That can be the drawback of, of doing spring aerifications. Sometimes though, you got to kind of pick your poison and, and figure out what's going to cause you a bigger problem later on, a compacted surface or dealing with a little bit more of the, the POA issues. In the fall, fall's probably the single best time to aerify, no matter what you're doing on, on cool season turf, September through November. Uh, again, work around your meat schedule to figure out when the best time to do that kind of work is going to be. On warm season grasses or Bermuda grass surfaces, you know, generally speaking, May through early September, general rule of thumb that I like to use is, you know, try to avoid aerification about a month prior to overseeding in the fall uh, to avoid that polka dot effect, if possible. I've seen people do that. They go out a week or so, or I've even seen people aerify when they, when they overseed. If you're looking for a nice even overseeding, if you aerify very close to when you're doing fall overseeding, it can cause you to look like you have a bunch of polka dots all over the place. Sooner or later, once that rye starts growing, it'll kind of mask itself over time. But I've seen instances where it's very apparent for, for a month or two, and it may not be something that you want to have going on out there. And the easiest way to avoid that is just simply try not to aerify or pull cores at least, you know, a, a month out from when you plan on doing your aerification. Um, make sure that you're well after your last frost in the spring and try to do it about a month prior to your annual first frost date. And you can look at some charts. There's good information that a lot of the state extension agencies put out on, you know, fall frost dates. Just try to avoid that. Last thing I want to do on a Bermuda surface is have that soil opened up and allow that colder weather, and that colder air down into that surface. You're, you're setting yourself up for some winter kill issues um, and some frost damage and those kind of things. So avoid that if at all possible. What to use? Well, we've got a lot of options available to us when it comes to aerifying. So the photo in front of you shows just two standard mount brackets that came off of a, a John Deere type aerifier tractor mounted air to air fire 1500 unit you know on the left you've got the smaller tines those are a, a half inch coring tine and on the right you know those are like a five eighths inch coring tine you can go up to even larger than that and you can certainly go smaller than that but this just gives you a general idea of the different available availability that's out there in just a coring tine um, this next slide here is going to show you a couple different uh, tines that are available in general so on the left we've got a half inch coring tine goes to a three eighths inch star type tine or a shatter type tine, quarter inch solid, three quarter inch tapered coring and a one inch solid tine. The star or shatter tines are great for using when you're just wanting to relieve that compaction. We talked earlier about using a penetrometer to go around and, and determine surface hard, hardness and, and figure out kind of where your, your surface is at any given time. If you have to come out there and loosen that thing up slightly, a star tine is a good way of doing that because it disrupts the surface very little, but it actually opens it up quite nicely. A star tine actually has more open surface area 
in terms of what it affects because of its star shape than a solid tie-in. So we use those a lot. Uh, I recommend to people uh, the use of those units. They're nice. They're very minimally disruptive. A lot of times you can't even tell you, you, you used it as soon as you're done with it. They do a really, really nice job. Talked about the slide. I was talking about how larger cores are not necessarily always a better thing. This chart the district put out a couple of years ago is kind of interesting. You look at half inch hollow tines, the percentage of the surface you affect if you run a half inch hollow tine on one and a half or one and a quarter by one and a quarter inch centers, you're removing about 12.5, 12.6% of the entire surface when you run your airifier with those size tines on that surface. Whereas you look over there at three quarter inch hollow tines on two and a half by two and a half inch centers, you're only getting 7%. And when you go to a five by five spacing with a one inch tine, you're down to 3.14. So sometimes doing tighter spacing with smaller tines actually is gonna to, to do a nicer job for you. And always remember, bigger is not necessarily better. Pick what'll work best for your application. Mix up those tine depth, the tines and those depths, each treatment to avoid a lot of the problems that, that you, you may run into when it comes to creating hard pan, things like that. Looking at equipment, uh, there is a large variety of pieces of equipment that you can use from the soil reliever up there in the uh, left-hand corner to a coring type air fire that happens to be a walk behind greens unit, probably not something you'd use in your applications. But they have larger tractor mounted ones. You know, you're doing a little spot treatments, not really in your world in the equine uh, industry. We use that a lot in sports turf, like in front of mounds and things like that, where we're just trying to do things. You can always use the old walk-on ones. Uh, you know, you see them selling in the back of a magazine somewhere, <laughs> people using their yards. But, you know, the good old Ryan type roll along core air fires still do a pretty good job in a lot of instances. Don't be afraid to break them out if you have one. Airway units, love those things. They're great for, for applications on, on tracks. They make a large variety of different tine sizes for those things. And they make some of those units that are almost like a bat wing type thing that are really created more for the ag industry, but can do large, large 20 foot, 30 foot passes at a time. It's a vertiquake down the left-hand corner. It actually just cuts a slip, but it vibrates as it does so and opens up a lot of uh, space down in the, in the pores of the soil without really causing a whole lot of surface disruption. And then on the right, there's just a good old slicing unit. That's a good old pull behind Toro type aerator that has just a, a V blade slice blade on it. Great for Bermuda grass surfaces. Um, some of the newer type technology like the Air 2 G2 unit, that thing goes along and actually blows air down in the, into the root zone. From what I understand, it opens up a very nice pocket for the, the roots to fill into and things like that with zero surface disruption. Might be a little slow to use on a whole area, but say you've got a problem spot or two on your track, that might be a good option. And if you know you had a guy that just spent the whole day walking around in a circle with it, you could do the track with it. Um, Dr. Girdle and I talked about that uh, previously as it being a, a, an interesting option to use on equine surfaces. Um, and on the right, that's an aerovator. That unit rolls along and there's like knuckles on that unit that shake as it penetrates in the ground. It really does loosen it up. They're talking about, I think that's pretty similar to what they're talking about using at Keeneland. Downside is you need to come back and usually re-roll the surface after you've done it because it will fluff it up a bit. This particular unit actually has a rear roller on it and works pretty well. Clean up. Once you've pulled those cores, if your core airplane, how do you get rid of them? Left's an old uh, John Deere core, pull, uh, core pulverizer. You can use a sweeper, like you see the, the, the Toro sweeper unit there, and just remove them. Uh, more of a power type actuated sweeper there on the left, or just a good old drag mat. You can take that out there and break those up and do the same thing. You know, use what works for you. Each type of machine has its benefits and its drawbacks. There's a place for each of these in a well-rounded program. Mix and match, again, I can't emphasize that enough. It's really important that you use a couple different techniques to make sure that what you're doing gives you a well-rounded program. Speed, productivity, time constraints, your schedule, et cetera, it's all gonna help drive your decision-making. There's really no right or wrong way to approach it, but make sure whatever you do, you're doing something. And with that, I thank you, and we'll wrap it up and give it back over to Doc. This is Karen, and this is her land. She's been here a long time, along with Mojo. The first fence post went up here. Now there's 5,000 of them. After the storm, she started the cleanup here. And when she needs some peace and quiet, she always finds it right here. This is more than just land, it's home. Karen runs with us on a John Deere 3E Series tractor, because who says a day's work has to take all day? Nothing runs like a deer. Search John Deere 3E Series for more.
being a teenager and in high school and middle school is not easy for girls these days. And they get to come here, spend time working around the farm, spend time with the animals, and not feel that pressure until we go to horse shows. The first time I saw this land, I was about 12 years old. I came here with an old mentor. I fell in love with it as a little girl, and I said I was going to own it one day. My mother, when I was four years old, put me on a little pony walking around the zoo. That was it for me. I love at first sight. Like any kid, when I was younger, I wanted to compete more in the Olympics and go Grand Prix and do things like that. But I put that all on the side and realized I had a different agenda in life. I've taught about 800 kids in this area. A typical day starts early in the morning with feeding the horses. Then usually we clean stalls. This is a daily chore, sometimes twice a day. I'm always on the tractor, mowing, spreading things around, you name it. This is a John Deere 3025P. I love my tractor. I couldn't live without it. I like to just relax and be left alone. I call it my husband. He's very reliable, and it doesn't argue. <laughs> it's so easy to use. My 68-year-old mother has never driven anything like this before, and she was scared to death of it. And once she did, she loves it. She drives it all the time for me and helps me out around the farm. Being here in Florida, we deal with a lot of hurricanes, so it can be very stressful when we're in the path of one. That John Deere helps me so much. We go around picking up debris, moving, pushing things with the bucket. I always have an average of 50 students, so whenever there's a disaster that comes around, they're always here and they're ready to work. I call all my girls my kids. They're, they're like part of my family, and they get scholarships for riding, and so we try to keep our sport here a little bit serious but fun. We go to the horse shows. It's great for them. Good, very nice. Teaches them a lot of sportsmanship. How to be more in charge and have more self-confidence. A little stronger on that. There. The parents tell me all the time, you are such a huge influence in our child's life. I love to share my experience with these girls and be able to steer them in a better path. Everybody always asks me, how do you keep doing this? I say, just the sheer passion of it. What am I going to do? Get a condo on the beach somewhere? I'm happier here. I'm Karen Nice, and this is my land.